This hearing will come to order. Without objection, all members' opening statements will be made a part of the record. The chair notes that some members may have additional questions for this panel, which they may wish to submit in writing. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 30 days for members to submit written questions to these witnesses and to place their responses in the record. I now recognize myself for five minutes to make an opening statement. I thank uh, all the members attending uh, today and I thank the panel for being here today. I will make a brief statement because we're anxious to get to the testimony. But I find today a very interesting day in our history because there's lots in the news today. There's, uh, there's a uh, contempt vote in the House that will be voted on as well as there was a major Supreme Court ruling today which, is, which has caught the attention of uh, not only people in Washington, but everybody around the country. But I would like to suggest that uh, the hearings we're holding today are not to be dismissed as insignificant because we're dealing with a subject that is rarely thought about, but has a major impact on our economy, on how deficits are financed, how government grows, and how financial bubbles are formed and why we have crises, which are the corrections and the depressions. And so for, so for this reason, I think this emphasis today on fractional reserve banking is very apropos, apropos. Because without the understanding of this and the understanding of the nature of money, we really can't get to the bottom of the uh, business cycle. There are certainly those who argue that uh, fraction reserve banking is something that is advantageous. It facilitates the market. It makes credit easy. It, it causes economic growth. Others would choose uh, to say that there is also a downside for fraction reserve banking because uh, there is an encouragement of those who can find credit uh, rather easily, not coming from savings, but from a computer or a printing press or fraction reserve banking, causes problems. It causes problems because it does affect interest rates, it sends out bad signals, it causes malinvestment and overinvestment that indeed the marketplace requires that these uh, mistakes be corrected. And this is the reason why we're having these hearings today because much has been talked about in the last several years about the influence of the Federal Reserve itself, how it can increase the monetary base and high-powered money, but it doesn't end there. Money continues to expand with the cooperation of the banks with what we call the fractional reserve uh, banking. Uh, but we, we also have to deal with and think about exactly where capital comes in a free market system. My understanding that capital should come from work, hard effort, and having a savings. Don't consume everything you earn. If you can't save, you can't invest. And that's a big difference if you understand that capital comes from hard work and savings and then investment and it be distributed by the marketplace by the so-called price or the interest rates. Compared to saying, well, savings are unnecessary, don't ever worry, we can always provide the liquidity and the credit either directly from the Fed or indirectly through fractional reserve uh, banking. So if we indeed think about fractional reserve banking, we have to think about actually where capital come from and where the mistakes uh, come from and what causes them. But the fractional reserve banking is a major contributing factor to the ease with which uh, governmental bodies accumulate debt. And we can also emphasize the importance and nature, and we'll talk more about this today, is why there is a moral hazard connected to this. So if there is risky financial behavior with the monetary system we have, it is compounded by the fact that there are going to be guarantees in the system, the lender of last resort, the insurance that says that people uh, can be taken care of and be actually rewarded uh, for, these, for the mistakes that they made. And it seems to me that uh, the system seems to work on one part of the cycle and it's a total disaster on the downturn of the cycle. And that is a, something I think every American, every congressman, everybody uh, who cares about their fellow man and about a healthy economy should think about and consider it.
Because if indeed the business cycle is caused in this manner, there's actually an answer for us and there's something that we can do about it rather than uh, the demagoguing and the politicizing of these issues as goes on so often. So I want to pause there and make sure that if anybody else has an opening statement. If not, we will uh, proceed uh, to the uh, witnesses. The first witness I'd like to introduce is Dr. Joseph Salerno, who is a professor of economics and chair of the economics graduate degree program at Pace University in New York City. He is also academic vice president of the Ludwig von Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama, research associate of the foundation of the market economy at NYU and policy expert for the Heritage Foundation. He has written extensively on monetary policy, theory and banking and comparative economic systems. He finished his undergraduate study at Boston College and received his MA and PhD in economics from Rutgers University. Also with us today, we have Dr. John Cochran, he is Emeritus Professor of Economics and Emeritus Dean of the School of Business at Metropolitan State College of Denver and a senior scholar of the Ludwig von Mises Institute. He has published numerous scholarly articles on the refinement and development of the Mises Hayek Austrian theory of the business cycle. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Colorado, Colorado in Boulder. Dr. Lawrence White is professor of economics at George Mason University, where he specializes in the theory and history of money and banking. Dr. White is one of the leading experts on free banking and is a member of the Financial Markets Working Group at the Mercatus Center. He's, he is published in the American Economic Review and the Journal of Monetary Economics and has also authored three books on monetary matters, including The Theory of Monetary Institutions. He received his PhD in economics from UCLA and his undergraduate degree in economics from Harvard. Without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. You will be now recognized for a five-minute summary of your testimony. Dr. Salerno. Is his mic on? Is his mic on? I'm deeply honored to appear before you to testify on the momentous topic of fractional reserve banking. Thank you for your invitation and attention. In the short time I have, I will give a brief description of fractional reserve banking, identify the problems it presents for the economy, and suggest a solution. A bank is simply a business firm that issues claims to a fixed sum of money in receipt for the deposit of ready cash. These claims are cashable on demand and without cost to the depositor. In today's world, these claims may take the form of checkable deposits that are transferred to a, th a third party by writing out a check. They may also take the form of so-called savings deposits that require re withdrawal in person at, at one of the bank's branches or at an ATM machine. In the United States, the cash, for, the cash for which the claim is redeemable consists of Federal Reserve notes, the dollar bills that we are all familiar with. Fractional reserve banking occurs when the bank lends or invests some of its deposits, payable on demand, and retains only a fraction in cash reserves, hence the name fractional reserve banking. All U.S. banks today engage in fractional reserve banking. Let me illustrate how fractional reserve banking works with a simple example. Assume that a bank with deposits of $1 million makes $900,000 of loans and investments. If we ignore for simplicity the capital paid in by its owners, this bank is holding a cash reserve of 10% against its deposit liabilities. The assets of the bank are its cash reserves and various non-cash assets. The non-cash assets include business loans, credit card loans, mortgage loans, and securities issued by the U.S. Treasury and other financial authorities. These assets are titles to cash receivable only in the near or distant future. Now, the key to understanding the nature of fractional reserve banking and the problems it creates is to recognize that a bank deposit is not itself money. It is rather a money substitute. That is a claim to standard money or dollar bills widely regarded as perfectly secure. Bank deposits will be routinely paid and received in exchange in lieu of money only as long as the public does not have the slightest doubt that the bank which creates these deposits is willing and able to redeem them without delay or de expense. When this is the case, bank deposits are regarded as indistinguishable from cash itself. The very nature of fractional reserve banking, however, presents a problem for the bank. On the one hand, all of a bank's deposit liabilities mature on a daily basis, 
because it has promised to cash them in on demand. On the other, only a small fraction of its assets is available at any moment to meet these liabilities. The rest of a bank's liabilities will only mature after a number of months, years, or even decades. In the jargon of economics, fractional reserve banking always involves term structure risk, arising from the mismatching of the maturity profile of its liabilities with that of its assets. In layman's terms, banks borrow short and lend long. The inherent problem is revealed when the withdrawal of deposits exceeds a bank's existing cash reserves. The bank is then compelled to hastily sell off some of its longer-term assets, many of which are not readily saleable. It thus will incur big losses. This will cause a panic among the rest of its depositors who will scramble to withdraw the deposits before they become worthless. A classic bank run will ensue, and the bank will fail. But the failure of fractional reserve banks is only a minor problem. Its effects are restricted to the banks, stockholders, creditors, and depositors who voluntarily assume the peculiar risks involved in this kind of business. More important are the harmful effects that fractional reserve banking has on the overall economy. First, fractional reserve banks or, or fractional reserve banking is inherently inflationary. The issue of money substitutes, unbacked by cash, expands the money supply and drives up prices. Second, the lending of unbacked money substitutes artificially reduces interest rates below market equilibrium rates. This causes businesses to make unwise and wasteful investments and households to indulge in overconsumption. It destroys wealth and it creates financial bubbles that end in recession and financial crises. Uh, the inflation and business cycles generated by fractional reserve banking are greatly intensified by Federal Reserve and U.S. government interference with the banking industry. The most dangerous forms of such interference are the power of the Federal Reserve to create bank reserves out of thin air via open market operations, its uses of these reserves to bail out failing banks and its role as the lender of last resort, and federal insurance of bank deposits. In the presence of such policies, the deposits of all banks are perceived and trusted by the public as one homogeneous brand of money substitute, fully guaranteed by the federal government and backed up by the Fed's power to print up bank reserves and bail out insolvent banks. Under such a monetary regime, there is absolutely no check on the inherent propensity of fractional reserve banks to borrow short and lend long, to issue unbacked money substitutes, to expand the money supply, and to artificially depress interest rates. The solution to the problem is to treat banking as any other business and permit it to operate in a market completely free of government guarantees of bank deposits and assurance of Fed uh, bailouts. In order to achieve this ideal, the Fed would have to be permanently and credibly deprived of its legal power to create reserves from nothing. The best way to do this is to establish a genuine gold standard in which gold coins would circulate as cash and serve as bank reserves. At the same time, the Fed must be stripped of its authority to issue notes and conduct open market operations. Also, banks would once again be legally permitted to issue their own competing brands of notes, as they were throughout the 19th century and even into the 20th century. To conclude, in fact, on the banking market as I have described it, I foresee the ever-present threat of insolvency lurking over fractional reserve banks to compel banks to refrain from further lending of their deposits on demand. They would retain in their vaults and ATM machines the full amount of the cash deposits. This means that if a bank wished to make loans of a longer or, or shorter maturity, they would only do so by issuing credit instruments whose maturities match their loans. Thus, for short-term business lending, they would issue certificates of deposits with maturities of three or six months. To fin finance car loans, they might issue three or four year short bonds. Mortgages would take the form of five to 10 year balloon loans as they did in the 1930s and be financed by bonds of five or 10 years. In short, on a free market, fractional reserve banking with all its inherent problems would slowly wither away. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cochran. Mm -hmm. Chairman Paul and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to discuss the fractional reserve banking, central banking, and its relationship to economic and financial instability. Fractional reserve banking has historically been viewed by some economists and most monetary cranks as a panacea for the economy, a source of easy credit and new purchasing power to quicken trade. Better economists, however, recognize fractional reserve banking with its ability to create credit as a major source of financial and economic instability. Credit created by fractional reserve banks, credit extended beyond what could be supported by actual savings, 
while initially peer, appearing beneficial, output and employment increase in areas supported by the expanding credit is unsustainable and will end in a bust. A secondary consequence of the bust is a financial and banking crisis, the bank run and associated panic. panic. The establishment of a central bank was often, when not driven by fiscal priorities of a government, an attempt to achieve the first while mitigating or eliminating the second. For the United States in particular, the effort was misguided. Per Vera Smith, a retrospective consideration of the background and circumstances of the foundation of the Federal Reserve System would seem to suggest that many, perhaps most of the defects of American banking could, in principle, have been more naturally remedied otherwise than by the establishment of a central bank, that it was not the absence of a central bank per se that was the root of the evil. Recent research supports her conclusion. Compared to the pre-Federal Reserve era, the Fed has failed to provide the promised stability, and the Fed has guided a significant decline in the purchasing power of the dollar. The dollar currently has a purchasing power of less than 5% of the 1913 dollar. Fractional reserve banks developed from two separate business activities, banks of deposit or warehouse banking, or banks offering transaction service for a fee, and banks of circulation or financial intermediaries. Circulation banking, if clearly separated from deposit banking, reduces transaction costs and enhances efficiency of capital markets leading to more savings, investment, and economic growth. Fractional reserve banking combined these two types of banking institutions into one, a single institution offering both transaction services and intermediation services. While the development of fractional reserve banking, money creation, either through note issue or deposit expansion, and credit creation became institutionally linked. Banks create credit if credit is granted out of funds especially created for this purpose. As the loan is granted, the bank prints banknotes or credits the depositor on account. It is a creation of credit out of nothing. Created credit is credit granted independently of any voluntary absence, abstinence from spending by holders of money balances. The existence of a central bank with its ability to create high-powered or base money is a necessary prerequisite for excessive credit creation and a resultant boom-bust cycle. While 100% reserves could eliminate or reduce the boom-bust cycle and eliminate the threat of bank runs and panics, boom-bust business cycles are really a phenomena of central banking, not fractional reserve banking per se. Without a central bank, credit creation by fractional reserve banks would be limited in extent. Large misdirections of production caused by credit creation require either newly created base money or the promise to create new base money in the event of a crisis by a central bank. During a period known as the Great Moderation, roughly 1982 to 2000, the U.S. economy experienced a period of apparent relative stability and prosperity. The U.S. economy was then buffeted by two boom-bust cycles tied directly to credit expansion and low interest rates. While much of the discussion following the recent crisis focused on why the recovery has been so slow, a lesson that should have been learned is that credit-driven artificial booms cannot last. High-powered money-driven credit expansion, enhanced by the money multiplier of fractional reserves, is a major destructive power that misdirects production, falsifies calculation even in a period of relatively stable prices, and destroys wealth. Policy-induced booms tend to piggyback on whatever economic development uh, is underway. The interest rate break, which normally would stop the event before they turn into boom, bubbles and booms, is effectively neutered by credit creation. Uh, central bank response to the most recent crisis has moved, the direction, moved in the direction of greater, not lesser, central bank involvement in the economy. Recent trends are troubling. John Taylor recently reported that the Federal Reserve purchased 77% of the net increase in the debt by the federal government in 2011. The Fed is moving from a monetary policy to an industrial policy, a policy environment that is not a monetary framework. It's an intervention framework financed by money creation. These trends make a return to sound money, which involves abolishing the central bank and paper fiat money and restoring co commodity money chosen by the market and totally subject to the market and imperative. 
Fractional Reserve Banking supported by a central bank is a cause of the boom-bust cycle, both the dot-com and the 2007 financial crisis and Great Recession. Elimination of this, stort, this source of instability requires monetary reform, such as how HR Resolution 1094, which is most consistent with the reforms written in the, in the written testimony. H.R. 4180 would be a strong improvement over current Fed operations, ad, as would H.R. 245. But, those, but both of these, while improving monetary policy, would still leave the economy subject to boom-bust cycles. I thank you. And uh, now I'll recognize Dr. White. Thank you, Chairman Paul. Thank you, Chairman Paul and uh, members of the subcommittee. I want to uh, second what's been said by Dr. Salerno and Dr. Cochran. Uh, the problem is not fractional reserve banking per se, but the lack of constraints on uh, fractional reserve banking, which have been created by, one, uh, the Federal Reserve System, two, our system of deposit insurance uh, combined with too big to fail, and three, other uh, restrictions and privileges uh, placed upon banks. In my statement, I offer some historical background on the origins of fractional reserve banking, talk a little about the effect of fractional reserve banking on the money supply. Uh, but I think the important issue here is to focus on the problems of bank runs and financial instability and the reforms needed to uh, improve our banking system. So let me focus on that. Undoubtedly, the leading argument made in favor of government regulation of banks, at least since the 1930s, uh, has been the argument claiming that fractional reserve banking is inherently fragile, and so it needs a lender of last resort, it needs deposit insurance to prop it up. Um, I find that's actually not correct. An uninsured fractional reserve banking system is not, in fact, inherently prone to runs. It's not inherently prone to panics. The runs and panics that have been a problem in the United States uh, in the late 19th century and in the Great Depression uh, were due to weakness that was specific to the United States and created by uh, the legal restrictions and privileges that I've mentioned. Uh, it's true that runs have harmful effects. I don't think there's much disagreement about that, at least when a run takes place on a bank that's actually solvent. In, in a sense, the depositors think there's not enough to go around, but there really is. We'd all like to prevent that. but. Banks would like to prevent that, too. I'll talk about how they can do that. And the supposed remedy of deposit insurance, although it does reduce the number of runs, uh, it does so at a cost that's probably uh, greater than the, well, I think almost surely greater than the benefit uh, that it provides by doing so, because it, it not only eliminates the, the tragic runs, but it also eliminates the runs that are healthy, the ones that eliminate insolvent banks. And in the absence of that kind of mechanism, we rely on the good graces of the bank regulators to close banks when they begin to get insolvent. And we found that they're not actually very good at it. They tend to delay closure, um, and that creates great moral hazard problems. So a fractional reserve bank, it, it makes promises to pay on demand more than it has in its vault. Then it is possible that enough people will claim their money back that the bank can't pay everyone. And if that happens, as Dr. Salerno said, the bank is forced into hasty liquidation of assets. Uh, that's certainly possible. Uh, it, it typically happened historically when a bank was already insolvent. So it actually, the run closed the bank that ought to be closed. But it could happen even against a solvent bank. And because that's a possibility, some economic theorists have jumped to the conclusion that uh, banks in practice are actually fragile. But if we look at the historical record, and especially if we look outside the United States, uh, we find that that's not what prompted bank runs. What prompted bank runs was a justifiable fear that a bank was already insolvent. And that explains the pattern of bank runs over the, uh, over the season, over the business cycle, and it explains why bank runs were more of a problem in the United States than they were in, say, Canada, because the United States had a weak banking system uh, in ways that Canada didn't. And the United States system was weak because we restricted branching for so many years uh, and because we restricted uh, note issue by banks under the national banking system in ways that made them unable to meet peak demands uh, for currency. 
So the way banks can protect themselves from runs is two ways. One is to have a clause in their accounts that says, if necessary, we can delay redemption until we have enough time to liquidate assets in an orderly manner. That was used by some trust companies in the United States. But most importantly, banks have to assure their customers that they are solvent, and they have to behave in such a prudent way that there's no doubt about their solvency. And before deposit insurance banks did that, they held large capital positions, 20% capital was typical, but when the FDIC Act came along, the banks, hired, they, banks used to actually paint in their window, this bank has $5 million in capital. When the FDIC Act passed, they hired someone to go scrape that paint off the window and put in the FDIC sticker. Right? So FDIC protection took the place of what should be protecting depositors, namely bank capital. And since then, banks have held as little capital as the FDIC will let them get away with. Um, and the FDIC is not particularly good at <coughs> monitoring bank capital or discovering when banks have bigger liabilities than they uh, admit on their balance sheet. So I think our biggest problems today, let me talk about uh, bri very briefly in conclusion about what we need to do. Uh, we need to find some way of rolling back and ultimately ending deposit insurance at the federal level. Uh, we need to certainly end immediately the too big to fail doctrine because that compounds the problem and means that even uninsured depositors are not shopping around for a safe bank, so nobody is uh, monitoring banks for prudent behavior. So some way of ending that needs to be found immediately. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I uh, now yield myself five minutes uh, for uh, questioning. I I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Salerno, but uh, the rest of the panel, feel free to also answer it. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, under today's circumstances when we have the Fed doing what they're doing and we are concerned about fraction reserve banking. We know the Fed has an effect on interest rates and uh, in, in an inflationary impact, certainly on the monetary as well as price inflation. But is there any way to just roughly maybe separate the two? How much of an impact does fraction reserve banking have on interest rates, and how much does it have an impact on actually uh, the inflationary impact, which ends up with prices going up? Is this a major contributing factor, or not too relevant because the, bled is to, the Fed is to be blamed for everything? Can you put that into a proper perspective? Yes. Uh, on a free market, as I said, I, I don't think fractional reserve banking would um, be uh, too, too problematic. It would, would, would eventually, I think, um, wither away. I disagree with Larry on that. But when there is the, the, uh, a Fed, uh, a lender of last resort, someone who can print out reserves out of, out of thin air, uh, there's a, there's a really a, a, a symbiotic relationship between the two. The Fed needs fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking needs the Fed. So when, when, when fractional reserve banking, which I believe is inherently stable, gets into trouble, as when uh, Washington Mutual failed overnight, uh, you then have the Fed intervening because of the, of the too big to, to fail doctrine. And it, it's the very fragility of fractional reserve banking that causes the Fed then to engage in qu uh, quantitative easing one and two. So without fractional reserve banking, we would not have had these, um, these uh, unconventional ways of injecting money into, into the system. So I think, yes, the fractional reserve bank does contribute a, a great deal to the problem. But, but does it affect the interest rates per se, the fractional yes, reserve Yes, actually, banking? if the government just printed money and issued it, it wouldn't affect interest rates. If the government just printed up money and spent it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't affect interest rates. It needs to have fractional reserve banking in order to, to put down pressure on interest rates and therefore cause bubbles mm -hmm. and recessions. Either of the others have a comment? Yeah, I'm, I think the uh, Fed, even in a world without fractional reserve demand deposits, could affect interest rates by going out and buying a huge quantity of government bonds. That kind of open market operation will push down the price, sorry, push up the price of bonds, push down the yields on bonds. So the, it's true that fractional reserve banking gives the Fed, in a sense, more leverage. Uh, when it comes to the price level, uh, if the Fed expands the money supply by 10 percent, quantity theory of money tells us, and it, it, at least it's an approximation for the long run, the price level will rise 10 percent. And that's true whether you have 100 percent reserve banking or fractional reserve banking. Uh, so the Fed can raise the price level by a given percentage by expanding its own liabilities by that percentage uh, 
uh, and whether the commercial banks get involved or not uh, is not really important to that process. The, the new money comes from the central bank, uh, and it has that power over the price level with or without fractional reserve banking. Uh, Dr. Cochran, I, I think we can assume that um, with a system that we have and, and with the moral hazard of the guarantees, insurance, and the Fed being the lender of last resort, there are less runs on the bank than uh, we had without those, those guarantees. But does that in itself, if we don't see the runs where things have to change and go back to a more normal system, does this then encourage the uh, building up of more debt? Would this be the reason why the world is engulfed with debt? Because most people now do recognize that the world's facing a debt crisis. I mean, when you, people understand it when they look at Greece and these other countries, but look at ourselves too. But uh, do you think the fact that there aren't these corrections, we don't have old-fashioned runs on the bank, uh, that we end up with a bigger problem, which may be down the road, it takes a little longer to develop, but we end up with this huge debt crisis. That's a tough question to answer in the context of the, uh, that, but uh, I think as Joe alluded and Larry alluded, with the guarantees that we have, we essentially have weakened one of the control sides of prudence on the side is, is essentially the lender of funds and people depositing funds into a bank are lenders, okay, uh, had more restraint on deciding at least who and when and how they lended money when they knew the funds were at risk. So with some of these restraints that have been taken away, that we have less people paying attention to the safety and soundness of the types of instruments they've invested in. And then with the central banking that can create credit that once you set an interest rate target, in many ways there's uh, incentive for a bank, even if they don't have the funds currently available, to extend a loan, create the deposit, and then go out and either borrow the reserves in the federal funds market, and as they borrow in the federal funds market, and that would put upward pressure on the federal funds rate, then the Federal Reserve has an incentive to go in and create the reserves to sustain the overextension of credit. So yes, I think there is a interaction between the fractional reserve banking, these restraints, or the lack of essentially uh, risk on the downside to the depositors from the apparent safety that has mm -hmm. helped us over leverage. Well, thank you. I now want to uh, yield five minutes to the gentleman from uh, North Carolina, Mr. Jones. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, I sit here and uh, really appreciate you sharing your uh, intellectual abilities and, and uh, helping us better understand the pros and cons of fractional reserve uh, banking. And it leads me to a number of thoughts um, First of all, a week or so ago, we had Jamie, Jamie Diamond up here trying to explain how he lost $2 billion in investments. And then you read in the paper today, it wasn't $2 billion, it was $9 billion. And I, I, I listened to your feelings about fractional banking and whether this is a sound policy or not a sound policy and how it plays in. And I think, I'm from Eastern North Carolina, and, and I think I listen very carefully to the people I represent, their concerns about our monetary systems and is it strong, is it challenged, is it weak? And it leads me to a very simple point that I'd like your response to. Um, when the banks failed in the 30s, the Congress passed what they believed was legislation to create some confidence and some soundness in banking known as Glass-Steagall. Um, I have said many times that the two worst votes I've ever made since I've been in Congress, which is 18 years, the Iraq War and the repeal of Glass-Steagall. When I look at all these boutique-type investments that the banks have access to from the selling of credits defaults from all these different systems and, and fractional 
banking. How do you get back to some soundness? Because it looks like to me that what we're doing is gambling uh, on Wall Street. And I'm talking about the banks as well as the investment banks. I mean, how do we get back, Mr. Paul, we, I hate to think that he's leaving Congress because I think he has been such an expert, whether you agree with all of his positions on the monetary system. But I think we have allowed a system that is not sound at all. In fact, I think the system is becoming more and more fragile as we continue to move forward. And, and I, it, do we need to go back to something like Glass-Steagall? Do we need to say to the banks that uh, you've got to start banking instead of gambling? Wh where are we in this process, are you, all three? Uh, I, I agree with you that uh, Glass-Steagall was, uh, repealing it was, was ill-considered. Um, it wasn't really deregulation. It only deregulated the bank's asset side. It allowed SNLs to suddenly begin speculating, not just loaning in mortgages, but, but, but making loans, uh, uh, risky loans in, in the oil industry and so on. Uh, so I agree with you there. What, what I suggest is not to go back to, uh, not, not to, to uh, uh, put back in place Glass-Steagall, but to, 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 to um, uh, deregulate the liability side. Okay, that is what the, the, the ability of banks, bailing out banks and, and the deposit insurance uh, was what allowed banks to become irresponsible when you um, got rid of Glass-Steagall. So I would have kept Glass-Steagall in, in, in place. Uh, and when Congress was ready to repeal deposit insurance and when the too big to fail doctrine was, was gotten rid of, then I think banks would become much more careful. They'd operate more like money market mutual funds, which don't go bankrupt, which, which don't have any problems, which have adjusted to market forces. Yeah, um, I think that the, the act passed in the 1930s that has weakened our banking system more than any other is not the Glass-Steagall Act, and certainly not the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, but the FDIC Act. And when deposit insurance was very closely limited, small amounts and uh, banks, uh, as Dr. Salano alluded, uh, couldn't gamble with the money, then deposit insurance didn't generate a lot of moral hazard. But now sort of everything goes, and the big problem with the repeal of Glass-Steagall is that it's extended the subsidy of deposit insurance to risk taking to very creative risk takers. And so the what we need to do to get the genie back in the bottle is find ways to limit the access of risk takers to insured deposits. If they want to gamble with their own money, that's fine with me. I don't want to put any restrictions on hedge funds, for example. They're not involved in the payment system. They haven't been considered too big to fail so far. Let's hope that continues. Uh, but investment banks sort of fell into this gray area where traditionally they were not considered part of the Fed's purview even, but uh, five years ago the Fed decided that it needed to jump in and uh, save Bear Stearns from its own foolishness, and I think that's been a real mistake, and that's led to a, uh, and encouraged a trend that was already underway toward over-leveraging. So it's not that all leveraging is bad, but uh, clearly we've gone too far. We've encouraged banks to go too far, and we need to take away those encouragements. I, I thank the gentleman. Now I recognize uh, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. White, you've been doing most of the discussing here with regards to deposit insurance. I'm just um, kind of an observation first, and then we'll get to a question. In 2008, in my district, there were a number of runs on banks, and people would go in and they take out ten to twenty thousand dollars worth of cash, but they also would take their money that was above the $100,000 deposit insurance level and move that to another bank. And that's a run of sorts in that it's taking money out of banks and shifting it around, although it didn't go in their pocket and, or in a tin can in their backyard. But because of the insurance that was in place, it did put a floor under some of this activity and did show that the, the consumer had a trust level to that much, at least. And I guess it was a trust in the government or the FDIC insurance backing it up. 
So I guess, you know, my question is, I understand where you're coming from, but I think, um, you know, if you open it up, make it the wild, wild west with regards to investments out here, and it's up to the individual to do his own research, it's going to get kind of hairy. Uh, I know right now, you know, in, in the past, banks have always had to publish a quarterly financial statement, and everybody could see what their, and it has to be disclosed in the public area so people could see the solvency of the bank. But how many of the average consumers in this room today can read a financial statement and understand it? I mean, it's pretty complicated stuff. So I, I, I'm questioning, you know, if we're going to continue with fractional reserve banking, uh, I think, you know, the, the deposit insurance certainly uh, is, is a part of that. And I've got a follow-up question when you get done with that. Well, um, I think you're right that it would be hairy if we eliminated deposit insurance tomorrow without any preparation because banks have adopted positions they've taken risks they put themselves in illiquid positions knowing that deposit expecting that deposit insurance will be there tomorrow so it would take some preparation to uh, even phase it back a little bit even to introduce co-insurance or uh, I would assume that if you want to get rid of the deposit insurance you'd want to raise capital requirements so that is that one of the ways you want to go well I would encourage banks to hold more capital. I'm not sure I'd okay. do it in the form of a requirement. But if, if we look over the broad sweep of banking history, we find very solid banking systems that didn't have deposit insurance and that where the banks held adequate capital because it was in their interest to do so. And so that's sort of the, the goal I have in mind. Now, getting to that kind of system, uh, we have kind of have a, a, a bomb in front of us, and we have to snip the wires in the right order. I appreciate that. It's kind of interesting because I was in a discussion this morning with one of the higher level uh, folks in the Treasury Department, and they are advising the Europeans to try and implement deposit insurance. So I'm just kind of like, you got to be kidding me. But anyway, yeah. um, I think you know you made another point a while ago I, I thought was excellent, and it, it kind of spurred a, uh, a thought here with regards to the, uh, the home mortgage problem that we had during the early 2000s here. You know, and part of it was access to money, lots of money. But the other part of it was the, the lending, loosening lending standards. And I think when the Fed throws money out there, if they would also think about restricting lending standards, I think that's another way to control the access to these funds. And I think if you see the quality of the uh, new loans being made by the GSEs, you can see that suddenly their, their balance sheets look pretty good on the loans they've made since this under new restrictions going back to old lending standards, which would seem to me to think, well, if we just done this thing right to begin with, it wouldn't be in this problem. But um, um, I'm kind of curious with regards to the 100% reserve banking. Um, you know, we have a bank that takes in all the money and all the deposits and lets us sit there and then it's just a sort of like a, a piggy bank that goes back and forth. And then we have a separate entity that's a loaning bank. Where does the loaning bank get its money from? Well, uh, if, if it can't lend out de demand deposits, checking account dollars, it can still lend out savings account dollars. So money that it takes in with certificates of deposit would still be available for lending. But, so it would, it would restrict the amount of lending banks could do. And the money that people hold so in other words, if you still make a deposit into your savings account or, or certificate of deposit, and that's the money then it's loaned out. It's not the not the checking account money. That's right. Or the now account money. Interesting. I, if I might interject, the, the savings deposits would have to be true savings deposits. That is, they would have to have some sort of 30-day maturity right. or something like right. that. Um, today, they, they technically do. You have to supposed to give 30 days notice, but that's been a dead letter since the 1920s. Has there ever been in history a, a system like this? Well, I, I think uh, the closest, the most nearby example is the Canadian banking system up until the First World War. They had nationwide branch banking. They had no restrictions. There were very few restrictions on note issue by banks, on deposit making by banks. And there were no panics in the Canadian banking system. They didn't have a panic of 1907. They didn't have a panic of 1920, uh, 30, 31, 32. No banks failed in Canada during the early years of the Great Depression. It's quite remarkable. And yet they had no deposit insurance, and uh, there wasn't any movement for deposit insurance. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, uh, Mr. Schweiker.
Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and I appreciate you all being here, because this is one of those, I know sometimes it feels a little esoteric, but um, I, I want to go a little bit to the side and, and, and sort of uh, make sure I have my head around part of the global side of where you see the problem. Um, and it's the, it, it, is it the expansion of sort of um, liquidity that, that the design now creates, correct? Or, I mean, is that a simple way to, to, to phrase it? Yeah, the loose monetary policy has been a big problem over the last and, and that becomes I, dollars that go in and create bubbles. That's right. Um, can, can we play sort of game theory for a moment? Um, do credit card issuers, in some ways, the way they're chartered and issue uh, credit expansion, do they add to that same sort of um, uh, liquidity out there? I would say no. I mean, a classic credit card, um, the, the money that is basically an, an instant loan, so that, that the money that you, you, you um, that, that is lent to, 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 or actually paid to the retailer that you purchase from, that money comes from, from, from a loan. It doesn't have to come from a fractional reserve bank. Um, is there a con you know, uh, an agreement that uh, an organization is organized to offer that type of credit? Um, how about a, a store credit or automobile credit or or even a credit line attached to your house. Does that create that same type of multiplier effect of expansion of money supply? If it's a legitimate loan where someone gives up the amount of money that, let's say, uh, an equity loan for five years, then they don't have the money to spend, and you do have the money to spend. That has no effect on prices, and that has no effect on interest rates. So it does not cause bubbles and financial crises and so on. But because everything is so tied up with fractional reserve banking, it, it ramifies into almost all, all of these loans. You, yeah. you actually almost went back to... Credit cards are not money. They, in some circumstances, they're a substitute for spending money, but if the total supply of credit is uh, determined, then it, it's a matter of what kind of credit is being issued. So, so, so but that's if it's um, a, on the back end is saying, look, there's a total amount of credit that's able to be offered, and we as the institution, you'll have to have that properly capitalized over here. Over there. That's right. Yeah. But, but money is an asset to the holder, and having an unused credit card line is not an asset. <laughs> so, so other than the sort of the ratios of deposit to how much can be lent out, are, do you see any other types of financial instruments or ac activity in the American marketplace that also creates that ex sort of expansion of cash that's out there f chasing assets? Uh, not in a big way. I mean, traveler's checks, a tiny bit. Okay. <laughs> not very big. Traveler's checks. So it's basically the Fed, fractional reserve banking, and then maybe a couple other uh, externalities out there, um, you know, issuers of certain lines of credit that do it with very little, you know, sort of a hope and pay type of system. Right now it's, right now it's, it's the Fed. It's the Fed pumping liquidity into the system. Um, in order to, to prop up these fractional reserve banks, which have, have extended loans that have gone bad in a, in a massive way. So I think that was th what Dr. Paul referred to as the, uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, complementarity well, between the Fed and, and fractional reserve banks. Okay, well, and, and this actually sort of ties back into what our chairman has touched on many times before. Let's say we're all sitting here three years from now. And the Fed is still buying, you know, a massive portion of the U.S. sovereign debt. You know, we still see the credit expansion. What does our world look like three years from now? Are we in uh, uh, debasing, you know, massive debasing of the currency? Are we seeing a huge inflationary cycle? What, what's, what, each of you, I'd love your prediction of what our world looks like 36 months from now if we continued on this path. Uh, if we continue on this path, and the banks be finally begin to lend money out because they're sitting out on a lot of this liquidity that's been injected into the system by the Fed. They have over a trillion dollars of, of excess reserves. If that's lent out, and we begin to see, I think what we're going to see is first a very rapid depreciation of the exchange rate. And with the overhang of foreign ownership of, of U.S. sovereign debt, what we're going to see happening is a dumping of that debt, further exchange rate depreciation, which is going to feed on itself push prices, import prices in the U.S. through, through the roof, and, and also interest rates are going to rise tremendously as people just unload the U.S. debt. Okay, so well, I, I see that happening. Yeah, I, I, I would tend to echo that, that I, my biggest fear is not really a total collapse in the currency, but a really 
return to the economic stagnation and inflation that was a real problem in the mid 70s through the early 1980s and I think is overlooked as uh, in this current crisis where people have jumped back and tried to compare this to the 1930s and our biggest threat is getting back to a period with significantly high interest rates with inflation premiums and double digit inflation and threatening double digit unemployment. So. Okay. With your patience, Mr. Chairman, may I have Mr. White answer? You know, I have the same concern about uh, inflation. I don't know at what rate, but we learned in the 70s, I thought, that you can have rising inflation even while unemployment is high. Right? The, the, the fact that there's slack capacity in the economy doesn't mean that prices can't start to be bid up uh, for the goods and services that you know people are buying and selling. So uh, Now, of course, the Fed assures us that it will start to pay attention to inflation if it rears its ugly head, but there's a lag in recognizing what the problem is, and there's a lag in turning that ship around. So I worry that inflation will rise substantially, uh, maybe between 5 and 10 percent, before they uh, can do anything about it. Um, uh, within that scenario, do you also see, literally, if you're debasing the currency in that, almost a currency war uh, between sovereigns? I think we are in a currency war. I think the U.S. has been waging a currency war from the 1960s, that is, devaluing its currency in order to, to help prop up so-called aggregate demand or total spending in the economy to continuously get us out of recessions and so on. All right. Thank you. And thank you for your patience, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, I believe we'll have time to go on with a uh, second round of questioning. So I'll yield myself uh, five minutes. Um, you know, suggesting that we could move into something like in the 70s with low, low growth and prices going up. History also shows that you can get inflationary depressions, too. <laughs> the depression actually gets worse, and, and then you also have the destruction of the currency, and let's hope we can prevent that from happening. But I, I want to ask the panel, and I'll start with uh, Dr. Salerno, about some of the challenges we get, those of us who believe in commodity money or even the gold standard, that they always throw the 19th century up to us, you know, and they say, well, the, the gold standard was a total failure because we had bank runs, that's why we had to have the Fed, and that's why we had to have this system. Um, but, you know, uh, Murray Rothbard wrote about, you know, the booms and the busts in the 19th century. He didn't blame the gold standard like they did in the 1930s. They said the, the gold standard was at fault. But he talked about the pyramiding of debt and, and, uh, and the uh, deposits and, and would that be uh, saying that there is some blame for fractional reserve banking for contributing to those crises that we had in the 19th century, and it was that rather than the gold standard that caused those problems? Yes, I think that's right, um, and uh, that, that the fractional reserve banking was really to blame for, for most of those um, panics and, and depressions. Um, particularly after the Civil War when we had the national banking system, uh, you, you had this, this pyramiding um, not only on gold, but, but, but the Wall Street banks pyramided on gold. The gold was concentrated in Wall Street. That was one of the points of the legislation. And then the country banks pyramided not on gold. They didn't hold gold. They held, held Wall Street bank um, notes as, uh, and deposits as, as their reserves. So we had this huge, unstable, upside-down pyramid, which was ready to topple over at, at the slightest a, 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 you know, problem or, 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 or small or large default on some loan, and, and, and that's exactly what the, the, the cause was, not the commodity money standard itself. Now, if we were back in the 19th century, what would have been the tool uh, for preventing those bubbles from forming? Would there have been a, a government role in trying to prevent what you just described? Yeah, get rid of, get rid of all of, of, of the policies that cause the pyramiding. Let the banks each stand on their own bottom. If they want to have fractional reserve banking, let them hold their own reserves. They if make they a get mistake. a loan from another bank, that they, well, they may, may be able to go on for a little while, right. but that would prevent it. You care to make a comment, Dr. Cochran? Yeah, and uh, some of the panics and problems with the banking system at that time were not a result of banks holding commodity reserves and making loans on that, but were actually restrictions put on their note issue that they first had to buy 
state government debt or with some of the national banking, federal government debt, and it was the government debt that was supposedly backing their note issue, not the commodity reserve. So there were some uh, very, very strange symbiosis between governments using the banking system to help their fiscal situation that were much more responsible for some of the panics and the financial crisis and the, the particularly the myth of the wildcat banks. So. Dr. White. Yeah, I, I would disagree with Dr. Salerno a little bit on this. Um, I think fractional reserve banking was a necessary condition for bank runs and panics, but it's not a sufficient condition. And if you look around the world, as I said before, uh, you find other countries that had sound fractional reserve banking systems <clears throat> where the banks were not artificially hamstrung, they were well diversified, and they did manage their own reserves, as Dr. Salerno said. They didn't have inter-regional banking uh, banks deposits of reserves like country banks into city banks and city banks into New York because banks were allowed to open their own offices in the financial capital. Right? So they didn't have to put their money in the hands of another bank and then create that instability. Uh, but under the national banking system, the, the reserve requirements were structured in such a way that it encouraged this kind of interbank depositing. But if you look at Canada, if you look at Scotland, which is my favorite example, if you look at Switzerland, if you look at Sweden, you see systems where banks were on their own two feet. They had the penalty of failure in front of them if they failed to keep enough reserves or to invest prudently. A and the banking systems were competitive and they were s uh, solvent. They were solid. Uh, so that's, that's how I would draw the lesson. Okay, thank you. So I now yield uh, to Mr. Jones from North Carolina. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I, I couldn't help but think with, in some of your answers, and uh, several of you have mentioned other countries and their system seems to be relatively sound. And, and I couldn't help but think, well, that's because they probably have a different system of raising money for campaigns. <laughs> uh, this country, I, I don't think we could ever uh, do what's right for the banking system or some other systems uh, as long as we have uh, lobbyists that... Uh, both parties raise money, and I'm guilty of that too, by the way. And they have influence when people like yourself, who I have great respect for, you're professionals, you're intellectuals, uh, you've, this is your area of expertise, so to speak. Uh, you probably could help us write a really good bill that maybe would make some meaningful changes and, and make the system a little bit more uh, sound. And yet, uh, you other than hearings like this and, and other committees, uh, you probably, that's the limit. Uh, and I, I guess my, my, my point is that I don't know how we're going to ever get the system uh, sound again as, as long as, as, as the uh, paid lobbyists come down here and tell us they like this page of the bill. They don't like that page of the bill, so you need to change that. And... Uh, do you have any thoughts? I really take you way off field, so to speak. But do you have any thoughts about, uh, you know, a system like ours, uh, which really doesn't encourage the honesty and integrity to change things for the good of the system, but also the good of the people? I'll just, I'll end at that and let you take a shot at it. Uh, I work at a, a university in New York City, uh, a few blocks away from Occupy Wall Street, and I think that things will only change, especially in the banking sector, uh, when we have a grassroots movement that shares some of these opinions uh, that is like Occupy Wall Street, and that it spreads throughout the constituencies of, of, of the U.S. And I, I think that's one of the things that we should be working to do. And I think Congressman that think like yourself and Dr. Paul, that things should be changed, should, should, should encourage these, these movements um, to the extent that you can. And the concern's not just limited to banking. I think uh, Adam Smith, as far back as 1776, which I think also is a significant date for this country, uh, really phrased it that, um, that 
for the economy to operate properly, it needs to be an elimination of all systems of privileges and restraints. And the lobbying you come in both is necessary because of the unnecessary restraints we put on market participants, but also them recognizing that the system that restrains them also can be the system that grants special privileges and and monopolies in the true sense, which is a government protected uh, privilege to offer goods and services to the public. So. Uh, in the 19th century, we had a weak banking system because the small banks had the very powerful lobby and they lobbied for restrictions on their competitors so that they could stay in business. Today, 21st century, it's very different. The main problem of weakness is caused by privileges and the privileges are being lobbied for by the largest banks. And the weakest banks are no longer the smallest banks. The weakest banks are now the largest banks, and they are the most dependent uh, on these privileges. So they're the ones who are going to be uh, lobbying the most to keep these privileges intact. And I don't know how to uh, solve that problem, but it's long been a problem that when they're in any area of the economy, if there's uh, privileges and restrictions at stake, there are going to be people who are trying to shape legislation around those things. So there has to be some kind of greater uh, attitude toward letting the banking system operate without privileges and without restrictions. C can well, I just add to that very quickly? Um, Murray Rothbard, the economist, once said that the way you get true change is to have um, statesmen and, and educators who really are interested in the public good reach around the, the, the privileged elites and, 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 and get their message out to the public. Well, I think that maybe the Citizens United decision might bring some sanity to um, the system. It won't happen in my lifetime, but maybe in our children, grandchildren, that maybe this would be a system that goes back to being the people's representative instead of the lobbyist representative. And I, I think it will happen in time. I, I hope to live long enough, maybe in a, in a uh, retirement home, to see it happen. But I'd love to see that happen. But thank you for your comments. I thank the gentleman. Now I yield uh, to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, interesting conversation. I was um, <clears throat> uh, struck with some of the comments with the gentleman from uh, North Carolina. and. Um, Kind of got me thinking about what if uh, make you king for the day, president for the day, congressman for the day, whatever. Uh, if how, how would you solve our our situation now with the weakness that we have in our system? What what changes do you think we need to be implementing or are working for to get our system back to where it's solid on solid ground and 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 make it all work? How would you ease it into a more um, workable solution? Each one of you. I think the first step is to get rid of the too big to fail doctrine. Wholesale and forthwith. Do it right now. And then phase out, I probably would phase out more quickly than Larry, the uh, FDIC insurance you know, within the year or something like that, within a year from, from, from the date that you get rid of the too, too big to fail doctrine. So in other words, those are you, the first important steps. So Sorry. in other words, what you would suggest is, is to put the onus back on the, on the banking system for their own uh, the responsibility for their own decisions, their own risk has been taken by themselves, not the taxpayer or the FDIC insurance right. folks and nobody else. Okay. Because at bottom, all they are business firms. They're not yeah. special. They should not be special. They should yeah. not be privileged. They should yeah. operate on a market, bear the burdens of the risks they assume, not only them, but, but any depositors that want, want to, to, to put money into a fractional reserve bank. They must realize what the, the consequences can be. You know, it's interesting. I made the comment the other day in committee that, you know, I think for the first time in several years here, people are actually now finding out what banks do. They don't just sit there and take deposits to make loans. They manage risk. That's what they do every day. And as a result, I think the, uh, the consumers and, and, and the citizens of our country are finally figuring out that, whoa, this is a risky business, and they're, they're, there's, there's some responsibility on, on somebody's part here to manage that risk, and it's determining who, who takes the risk, who manages. That's, that's our dilemma right here now with what's going on. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Cochran. Yeah, I would echo uh, Joe's, uh, Dr. Salerno's comments that the too big to fail doctrine has got to go first. And really with it, the mentality uh, that bailouts are going to come in and 
across the economy, whether it's banking or others, and protect people from the risk they undertook. Uh, back to the deposit insurances, when it appeared that some of the money market funds were going to break the buck, we came in and uh, de facto uh, offered insurance for the deposit on the money market funds, which just again reinforces uh, the deal. And then probably on the monetary side, I would look at eliminating all the restrictions right now that make it difficult for anybody to come in and compete with the system. That uh, I think recently we had someone just arrested for coining gold that could or could not have been used uh, as a medium of exchange and competition so that we, we really don't allow people who would even want to choose to contract in something payable other than in Federal Reserve notes to write a contract that would be enforceable for payment in ounces of gold or other mediums of exchange. So. Dr. White. Uh, in addition to the points that have already been made, I would say that uh, the Federal Reserve needs to be constrained uh, so that it doesn't create such an unstable environment and so that it doesn't issue what became known as the Greenspan put, which was the sort of open suggestion that if the stock market starts to go down, we'll pump in enough money to keep everybody afloat. That sort of thing leads to a relaxation of prudential standards. Uh, and I think that's been a big problem in the banking system. Now, it, under this kind of caveat emptor system that we're suggesting, it's true people will have to shop around for a bank. And people will have to re-educate themselves to how to do that. But people nowadays shop around for a mutual fund. They don't understand exactly how mutual funds operate. They get a prospectus, and they don't really know what to make of it. But they do know who does know. Right? They can read Money Magazine, they can read investment newsletters, and they can seek out the advice of experts. And people can exercise at least that much prudence when they choose a bank. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back to balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. Uh, now I recognize Mr. Schweikert from Arizona. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm back to our happy part of the discussion, which is how the world comes to an end. Um, <laughs> It, 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 looping back to the discussion of whether it be three years or five years, whatever the time frame is, um, you know, we seem to all have a universal agreement here that um, with this, the massive amounts of liquidity that are out in the system, um, we see inflation. We may see a runaway type of inflation. Okay, each of you just became Federal Reserve Chairman. Congratulations. How would you... <laughs> Actually, I, we, which I'll nominate. <laughs> um, in all sincerity, how would you guide the ship uh, monetary policy? How would you pull that excessive liquidity out of the system? You know, what proposals would you make to avoid that ugly scenario? Let's start. Let, let's start, with Dr. White. Okay. Um, well, the, the same way it went in, it can come out. That is, the Fed can sell off its mortgage-backed securities, and the Fed can sell its uh, Treasury bills back into the market. Now, at the same time, the Fed can reduce the incentive of banks not to lend by scaling back the interest they pay on reserves. I mean, banks are sitting on more than a trillion in excess reserves, in large part because the interest rate the Fed is paying on those reserves is about the same as the interest rate the banks can earn on T-bills. Would you also, in that same scenario, raise reserve requirements at um, chartered lenders? Uh, reserve requirements aren't really relevant these days. They're pretty much not binding. Most banks have more cash in their ATMs than they are required to hold. Okay. Total required reserves in the system are something like $80 billion, and banks have more than a trillion dollars in reserves. So reserve requirements are not really going to do the job. Doctor? Yeah, the, and one of the things I would echo is that, they, that you can pull out these excess reserves the way they got in by basically uh, where you'd purchase, now sell them. Uh, one of the dangers going in is that as they've changed their balance sheet from short-term securities to longer-term securities, that the value of those securities, the mortgage back and others, are much more 
susceptible decline in value to rising yeah. interest rates. So there is a uh, damning in there. I do think that given the amount of excess reserves that are in the system that um, a possible way to avoid this besides reducing, uh, as you reduce the interest that they're paying on these ex excess reserves, that it is possible that a consideration of a significant increase in the required reserve ratio could be an effective tool as you take more time to pull and sell off some of these assets. But okay. And, and once the, 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 this all was reversed, the excess reserves were sucked out of the system, um, I would then, if I were the Federal Reserve Chair, just stop open market operations at that point, stop printing up reserves and purchasing government securities. And then that would stop the, 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 uh, the next influx of liquidity into the system that would, would, would get the whole thing started again. Okay, you, you're, you're more optimistic than, than I am, I guess, mechanically. So, but I have one of you who doesn't think raising reserve requirements it, it, it would be effective just because of how um, much uh, margin there is there. And you, you actually believe that would be one of the tools. I think it should be a consideration. It would be not a first tool, but it could be a tool that... Um, could allow more of a phased sale of the securities without allowing the reserves to start flooding excess lending into the system. Okay. Dr. White, you looked anxious there. Well, it, it is possible to make reserve requirements binding if you're really determined to do so. But, you know, banks have gotten very good with computers at sweeping the reservable deposits off the books at the end of the day. And that makes it very hard to enforce reserve requirements. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I thank the gentleman. And I want to thank our witnesses for appearing today. Uh, as I said at the opening, I believe these are very important hearings, and I appreciate very much you being here. Uh, this hearing is now adjourned.